Hi everyone, so today's topic actually is something that I've only briefly touched on. So there are many toxins um, that can affect animals and toxins are generally chemicals that cause adverse effects on an organism, whether it's a plant, whether it's um, an animal um, or bacteria. So it's kind of a negative effect rather than you could say a drug which has sort of any effect. Um, so diaminase is a word that does get used occasionally but not that many people are actually aware of it. Diaminase is a toxin found in many frozen and live feeds that we feed our fishes, particularly predatory fishes. This toxin over time can result in stunted growth, neurological disorders and eventually death. So it's quite a sort of a serious toxin. It can take time and it depends how much you feed it. But for some fish, this is almost entirely what they're fed. And a lot of the effects could look quite similar to, say, swim bladder disorders or other sort of what may look like a sort of a lack of balance. So diaminase is more accurately an enzyme, so a biological catalyst. The, it promotes the breakdown of a vitamin known as B1, also known as diamine. And you could think any organism that contains diaminase, if consumed, won't contain much diamine in addition to those predators that can consume diaminase won't have, will have their own diamine broken down within their body. So it's a double whammy. The food doesn't have much diamine and the, um, uh, the diaminase from the prey that um, actually breaks down even their own diaminase, a uh, diamine. So what kind of foods contain diaminase? So stuff like prawns, mussels, carp, that includes goldfish, minnows, cat, um, a number of catfishes, I'm not sure whether all of them contain it, clams, tuna, scallops, um, mackerel. So that's quite a wide range, especially mussels are used quite frequently. They are very good at weaning fish into actually eating, but they actually might not be so good. But more importantly, why is this like, well, why is this important? Diaminin, di diamine or vitamin B1, that diaminase breaks down, is important in maintaining many biological, physiological processes within the animal and also maintains the health of an animal. As thiamine is important in nerve and neurone function, this is how with the, a deficiency, neurological disorders will occur. And this is common with um, the fish will lose coordination and develop swimming abnormalities. It has been seen also in fit, uh, snakes that are fed frequently fish, so garter snakes, if they're fed entirely um, on fish and they're fed, in, um, or not even entirely, largely on fish that are high in diaminase, that's when this can uh, occur. There are other things that contain diaminase as well, such as bracken, but I doubt you're going to be going out and collecting ferns to use um, to feed your fish. Diaminin is all, uh, sorry, thiamine is also very important in body condition and coloration. So these tend to decrease under high thiaminase diet. Particularly, studies have noted the yellow pigment or yellow col coloration does decrease but this was only one study on a particular I think it was on salmon not just that but immunity is shown to decrease with a diet high in thiaminase this could be that they're stressed so under higher physiological stress due to maybe the neuro um, neurological issues or um, other um, issues that could cause that drop in immunity because they're trying to compensate and it's maybe getting a bit too much would be a good way to describe it. Diamine, diamine, diamine sorry, it, it's a lot of mouthful words. Um, diamine, diamine is important in the production of energy in the fish. 
So the fish will get lethargic over time, and that's probably the major reason why immunity drops. So it's quite a bad chemical. Um, it's quite a toxic chemical that can cause a lot of adverse effects, especially over time. And therefore, it's probably best to avoid it apart from the odd treat. I'm not, I don't think it tends to biomagnify. So this is a the process of, it do, it's not really removed from the fish's uh, body or organism's body over time. Whereas take, uh, for example, um, some like heavy metals, they're always, um, they're retained within the organism or radiation um, over time rather than is processed out that's such a bad description um, but it can be per, uh, passed through prey to predator and onwards so if that prey has eaten or um, consumed something with high diaminase it can transfer to the predator so maybe it's worth even thinking what those feeder fish might have been fed so I explicitly mentioned frozen and um, frozen and uh, live foods. But what about dry foods? So dry foods are actually fine due to the fact they've been cooked and cooking generally destroys and removes the thiaminase. Even if they um, contain species higher in it, so a lot of diets or dry diets would contain muscle. And so this is really in reference to frozen fish and live foods, which are rarely, well, live foods won't be cooked. Frozen is very rarely cooked, and probably because of the price point. Another risk with those sort of very fresh foods is obviously the parasite risk. Generally jumping from um, marine to freshwater, as in you're feeding marine species to freshwater species, there tends not to be that massive um, high risk because it's quite a jump between the two. So what can you do about thiaminase and how can you avoid it? Fe generally just feeding foods not high in thiaminase, such as earthworms, roaches, trout, cockles. But in general, getting fish onto dry diets is really good. You can get a whole mu wider range of nutrition vitamins, minerals, just from any dry diet really. Um, many dry diets will also supplement the thiamine. So it is worth, or at least if you're struggling to get a fish from frozen to dry food, what I've done is actually sh shove the pellets inside of the frozen food and then kind of trick them that way. Or working out whether there's a particular live food, a uh, frozen sorry, a particular dry food that the fish will take. So for example, I fed, um, well might have actually been, they might actually feed on scales in the wild, but they also fed on live fish. Um, if I got the right flakes and sort of placed them on the surface, or hit them at the surface the right way, the fish would go for them. And this was some kind of pike kerosene. But do we really need these thiamnase rich foods So. Not really, there's so much selection of actually things that don't contain thiaminase. Even within a fish store or aquatic store's uh, frozen selection, you can always go to reptile stores and get stuff like um, all the different roaches, insects. It's just a bit difficult to make insects sink. Um, oh, in addition, mollusks, snails are really good. Um, so maybe feeder snails, obviously they might be a little bit difficult with sinking. So it's worth noting that some fishes might actually be tolerant to thiaminase. And this is only an assumption of mine. And these are ones that feed on organisms that are high in thiaminase anyway. The majority of the fish we keep in the trade though won't be. Most of them aren't actually naturally piscivores or they feed very infrequently on fish. So they're unlikely to have built that resilience to thiaminase if, if they can, if fish possibly can um, do that. Generally, a lot of those thiaminase rich foods are marine. I, I guess obviously carp, the catfish is um, mentioned, stuff like that aren't. Um, 
But it's also a highlight that those piscivorous fish are feeding on a wide diversity of different fishes in the wild. So they're not feeding focused on minnow. Or it's highly unlikely. So it means that they're less likely, they probably don't depend on having that resilience or a resistance to thermines. So also many, many of them, even though they might not feed on the fish, with um, the high diamonds in the wild, they probably won't be eating mussels, prawns, or clams naturally. <laughs> anyway, there's one thing else about mussels though. Mussels can actually be double as problematic due to the fact they're filter feeding in nature and the location mussels live in. They can be very high in heavy metals. Heavy metals such as cadmium, mercury, arsenic and lead have been detected in, well, quite a lot of mussel populations. And heavy metals bioaccumulate and they build up in the individual over time. Many heavy metals can result in serious neurological disorders and it's just not worth risking that, I would say, especially with mussels. Um, so I would personally avoid mussels as much as you can, especially for this um, risk of heavy metals within fishes. And this could be partially why there might be a higher mortality um, in certain fishes than others, or why they start doing certain things, or it's very difficult to define. But anyway, I hope this video was useful. I hope it's sort of brought awareness because not everyone knows about thermines or um, has really looked into it. Um, goldfish minnows are still available as very common live feeders for fish. So that is a particular risk or hazard. Um, mussels are still um, sold as well, one of the most popular feeds, frozen feeds. And they are almost pushed at, at anyone with larger fish as well as prawns are. So I think that is a major concern. So I would say the message from this is diversify, Lo feed loads of different foods, really try and get onto dry foods as well. Um, stuff like Rapashi caters for a wide variety of diets and a wide variety of vitamins, minerals and nutrients. But in general, you're going to get more nutrition from any dry feeds than you are going to get from the very limited variant uh, variants of frozen and live feeds. Um, anyway, thank you for watching. If you like my vi videos, then comment, um, subscribe, um, like the video, whatever. Um, and thank you for watching.